thank you all for coming. Thank you for Garrett for inviting me again. I was here last year. I'm not going to use slides. Uh, the reason I don't use slides is that I tend to make up my talk the evening before, depending on what's being discussed. Um, ostensibly, it's going to be about zero MQ. Now, you were at the keynote, and you we went through a list of attributes of a reactive system, decentralized, event-driven, scalable, <coughs> resilient. You remember that? Yeah. And you were probably all asking yourselves, this sounds fun. How do I actually do that? You know, it's, it's like saying you must you know, eat well and live long and be happy. These are nice keywords, but execution is a lot harder than having the idea. So luckily for you, luckily, we began solving this problem about five years ago, and we have the answer. And it's, actually, it's actually that simple, and there's Josette Garcia from O'Reilly Jokes has the book there, so go and buy the book. There's like five or six copies, and I will sign it. And I'm not going to go into much detail about the technology because it's in here in exhaustive detail. And I make my money from selling books, so do buy the book. It's a very good book. What I will very briefly explain why ZeroMQ is a, an awesome answer to these problems. It's not the only answer out there, but what it does particularly well. And I will also take that into something a little bit more human, less technology, and more about people. And one of my ideologies about software is that it's really about people, much more than about bits and bytes and machines. People are our fundamental physics. And building a distributed system is about building a large architecture is essentially about organizing people. Okay? And although we are all engineers and we all talk about think of in terms of code and so on, the really difficult challenges are people-based. So I will present to you today uh, a thesis that I got in my mind last night, thanks to Martin, which is based on Conway's law, um, which is about how to build large systems, and it really is also how to build large distributed systems using zero MQ. Now we've noticed when people use zero MQ, is they form certain categories, and there's a specific category. Some people take it and fly with it and build systems, and they vanish into the mists, happy and successful, and they make amazing stuff, and they don't talk to us again, they just take it and fly. But a large number of people take it and use it and say this stuff is great, but they get stuck. And they have a problem crossing from the world they're in today to the world they want to go to, which is this amazing world we talked about this morning. So I'll explain how to cross that uncanny valley, the chasm, from the old way of thinking to a new way of thinking. And it's not just about software and libraries, it's about how we think and how we organize. Okay? And that's why I'll talk about that, to successfully use this stuff. So very briefly, what ZeroMQ is and does, who does not know this? Hands up if you do not know this. Okay, it's very briefly, it's a, up to level five, it delivers payloads, it delivers contracts. Okay, think of it like that. Level six is the contract, it's the encoding. That is the, what ZeroMQ delivers to applications, be they anywhere in the world, be they connected through any transport. It does that in an event-driven, well-queued, well-batched, the right strategies for throwing away messages and not blocking and everything else. Resilient, simple. Good answers to a whole bunch of problems, as you will find out when you look at the damn thing. Okay, do look at it. Conway's Law. Who knows Conway's Law? Can someone, except for Martin, someone state me Conway's Law? Any system organizations, they tend to be the same after a certain time. So, I remember this from a long time ago when we, when we used to make compilers. This was in the days of Alcohol. And, and it's the joke is, you know, a team of five will make a compiler with four passes. Because one guy has to be project manager. <laughs> right? And the four guys will each break it up. And the work will naturally structure itself around the people. And there'll be all kinds of rationalization. Why four passes? But it'll really be because there were five guys. That's all. That's all it was. So turn this around and say, if you want to build a big system, start by building the team, the organization, the structure of the people, the structure of your company or community. And out of that will emerge the software with a, the same similar structure. Think of the team as the framework on which the software will emerge, rather than the team being something you, you, you kind of hire people and put them into offices and have meetings and so on. 
So if you're talking about decentralized, event-driven, reactive, resilient, learning-driven software, you're talking about decentralized, reactive, resilient, scalable, learning-driven teams. Okay. All of the properties that we heard this morning about the software really apply to the organization that makes the software. That's my thesis. I think it's accurate. Time will prove it. I know there are many companies that don't do this and that have very old-fashioned teams making what looks to be very modern software. I think they're just paying a very high price for it. So there's this notion that you can do things, like, for example, concurrency. You can scale just by sheer effort and investment. And you can do shared state concurrency even to you know, 16 threads if you're willing to pay. And the question is one of cost. Can you scale 16 threads by not paying? For the same cost as one thread. If you can do that, you can scale to a million threads. So let's take some of the, we know the problems in shared state applications. We know the problems with failures and locks and synchronization points and you know the slowest point of the whole system. We know all these problems, we've seen them all. Think of similar problems in organizations which are synchronous. Think of meetings <coughs> and conference calls. Who likes conference calls? Who enjoys conference calls? Interesting. Who enjoys meetings? I mean, apart from the social aspect and the beer, who enjoys actually going to a meeting? Who thinks that's a great way to, to work? Nobody. I mean, very few people actually enjoy meetings as a, as a way to, to work. We need them. We have no choice. We've learned that they're the way to communicate efficiently and remove some assumptions. But they're not an enjoyable thing. And for me, meetings are like the mutexes of organizations. They're anyone can block, anyone can take control and block something. And the synchronization points are incredibly expensive incredibly bad for scalability. So if your organization depends on people being in the same room, that's very similar as having software that depends on people sharing the same state, the threads sharing the same state. It will not scale, and it will not build scalable software cheaply. And if your organization is using zero MQ and still working in that way, your results will not be good. It will fail. It will be horrible. <coughs> that's, my, that's my thesis. So to successfully use zero MQ or anything like it to build systems of the future. Let's go through, by analogy, how we build such systems and then by analogy how we build such organizations. Okay. So what, what are the core elements of building a distributed system? We, know what are the, we, we use these words, distribution. Distributed, first of all, means that time and space are broken up. Things happen at different times, and things happen in different places. It's very important. If I'm talking to somebody, they may not be there, they will not be here, they may not be at the same time. I send a message, it may arrive at some unknown future in some unknown place. Okay. And this very strong assumption in shared state systems that we are in the same space at the same time is completely flawed. Of course it works, you call it the crack cocaine of, of software development, I think it's the crack cocaine of organizations. Let's get all together and have them in the same space. It seems very simple. It does not scale. Scaling costs are very expensive. If your systems are distributed over time and space, they're also heterogeneous. They're also different. You have different languages, different operating systems. You will not be able to standardize on one language. It's a failure point. To say we will use language X is a dramatic <coughs> failure. It may work in the short term. It's a dramatic failure that will kill your system, that will kill your company, that will stop you succeeding. So by definition, the language is not a solution. The language will not help you. You have to be able to handle any language because the team in the future, in different country, different time zone, will have a different technology. It goes without saying that we have events and queues, that's how, otherwise you cannot synchronize, you cannot send stuff if you're waiting for an answer in real time. Uh, we've worked on projects with time zones and it's really, really difficult to have a meeting with four different time zones. People waking up at four in the morning and someone else waking, you know, still at work at 10 in the evening. And this is really, really difficult. That's a synchronization problem. Sending events, well, you go to sleep, you wake up, your workload is there, you carry on. And the lazy execution of events in a simple pipeline is very scalable. Am I making sense here? Okay. So cross-language is very important. And then if you have people that are not talking to each other 
not able to resolve their assumptions by brute force, which is the meeting or the phone call. How do you resolve your assumptions? How do you agree on, on what's going to happen? How do you collaborate without upfront agreement and consensus? Who's using GitHub here? Fork pull request? We like it. Do you remember what GitHub page says about fork pull requests? That all important phrase. This lets you work without upfront consensus. It's absolutely critical. Not having to seek consensus means you can work asynchronously, you can work in any time zone, and you can come afterwards and deliver your work, and there's no synchronization points. It's a distributed development. So the key to a distributed protocol, so giving it away, distributed architecture are protocols. They're contracts written by evil lawyer-style people, which let you, as a team or as a person, talk asynchronously over time and space to other pieces I remember when I made AMQP, the first version, and um, a, guy, a bunch of guys at Rabbit took it, took the spec, without talking to us, implemented clients and servers, and came to us a few months later, and they talked. We, our clients and their servers, and our servers and their clients talked to each other from the very first day without a single fault, the change in messages. Protocols do that. They let you work asynchronously without any upfront consensus. So. Protocols are a technical thing that we've used in the past for building systems. They also work for building organizations. You can have the same approach. You can write the rules for an organization as an RFC. Thou shalt, thou may, thou must, thou must not. In fact, in, in, my, in my process documents, I, I refer to the IETF, RFC, whatever it is, 2138 with the keywords. I say these are our keywords for collaboration. And when we have a new project, we say, here's our process, RFC 22. Read it. If you agree, become a maintainer. And it works. It's shockingly simple. By, by buying into a distributed process, you're able to work completely asynchronously from other people. Okay. So now, <coughs> failure. We talked about failure this morning. In the, uh, you know, failure, failures happen. Well, I'll go further than that. I would say that failure is part of your process. Not just tolerating failure or recovering from failure, but expecting failure, even encouraging failure, learning from failure. This is old cultural dichotomy. Um, some countries hate failure. Korea, France, it's just really bad to fail. If you fail at school, make a mistake in your exams, you're in trouble. People aim for perfection, and failure is punished. In other cultures, failure is more tolerated and expected, and those cultures learn much faster, I believe. Um, certainly, when it comes to the systems that we run, we expect failure everywhere. We expect every message to get lost. We expect every process to crash, every network to get slow. We expect that. We, we build it into our assumptions, into our protocols. We have that. We, we have heart beating as a kind of a basic element of our, of our technology. We don't, we're not taken by surprise. Well, the same comes with organizations. We take failure as part of our process. So for example, I have this morning a, a patch on, on Zero Q Master, a pull request, of some code that I consider completely insane. And I'm being polite to the guy. I'm saying, I don't understand your use case. He's like, yeah, but blah, blah, blah. And I'm saying, I still don't get it. After five emails, I still don't get it. I'm going to merge it anyway. I'm going to merge this patch try and get it into one commit, try and get it to pass the, the Travis CI, I'm going to merge it. It'll fail. I'm pretty sure that that will break our, our master in, in functional terms, certainly in sanity terms. It will become a bizarre thing. So what is this code doing? It's a very bizarre security proxy thing. I don't understand it. And if I don't understand it, I'm pretty sure it's bogus. But I will anyway accept it. I'll merge it because it will fail and we will learn. And we will learn our way through the problem. And gives us as an organization, the, as a community, open source community, the way to build code by failing and learning. Collecting problems, trying to solve them, happily failing, learning as fast as we can and going through. Okay. And we spoke this morning also about latency and about performance. There's no point having a event-driven system that takes you two hours to process a transaction. You want it to two, two milliseconds. Okay, so the speed is very important. Who here has submitted a patch to an open source project, ever? Was it accepted? Keep your hand up if it was accepted. OK, good. Do you prefer to be accepted fast or slow? 
What's, what's your favorite, what's your preference? What makes you feel better as a, as a contributor? It's in the queue for six months or it's in the queue for six minutes? What do you prefer? Six minutes. Six minutes. Careful consideration. Sorry? Careful consideration. Of course, careful consideration <laughs> and then accept, right? Yes. Um, <coughs> you want response to your intellectual effort as fast as humanly possible. You want someone to actually look at it briefly, just check. Just, yeah, it looks same, merge it. You want someone to catch your, all your vulgar mistakes. But they don't want to be embarrassed by someone insisting on perfection. Like, this commit message is the proper English. Like, you know, seriously, it didn't come out. So the responses, responsiveness of a distributed system maps into responsiveness of a distributed organization. And how fast can you get a cycle, a process in cycle, end to end? Where, you know, is it, is it a matter of hours and days? And again, synchronization points. If you have to hold a conference call or a meeting to discuss a particular patch, you're dead, right? And this is the kind of situation that we've seen in many companies. I would make this change. Let's discuss it. Let's get upfront consensus from five divisions and a VP. Let's get you know, 12 sign-offs. Let's get a document. I still don't trust you. Let me get another, another proof. I want to see a prototype. And you go through six months of stress, and then the guy says, I don't really need this anyway, sorry. No. Make the patch. Merge it. Try it. You don't like it? Revert it. I mean, with Git, it's shockingly simple to recover from mistakes. There's no excuse for not allowing mistakes. As maintainer, all I ask is that all those commits are just like one commit. I can say one revert. I don't have ten reverts. It's kind of annoying. It makes a mess of things. So then the next thing, in a distributed system, who's in charge? I don't think you mentioned this this morning, but there's a notion of control. Where's the authority in a, in a centralized system? Who's in charge of the internet, apart from the NSA? I mean, who's in charge? The answer is nobody's in charge. <coughs> this is the funny thing. It's like, this is a question we used to ask ourselves, is who, who pays for the internet? Who runs this thing? And yes, both, we all run it together. It's, it's, a, it's a gross collaboration. And when no one's in charge, it's a very interesting uh, dynamic of how we communicate and learn also in software, also in organizations. When no one's in charge in software, there's no critical point of failure. With the internet, any box can die, and they do all the time, and it doesn't matter at all. The failures are always localized. But Peter, that doesn't work with middle managers. We were running a software project with two guys who took full responsibility and worked together, and the manager's about who's in charge. Yes. I want to know who's in charge. And the answer is you are. Yeah. You are now maintainer of our project. Let me teach you GitHub. We have no branches, it's six commands. Here's an interface for GitHub. You will now review every patch and you will always press the merge button, thank you. And please read the output of Travis. And they're like, ooh. Uh, middle managers are a problem. Middle managers are the brokers of a distributed system. They're, they're the people that insist on being important because they're important. It's like, you know, we exist and therefore we want work to do and therefore we will create a bottleneck in synchronization. No. Um, even middle managers prefer to be productive than to know that they're just floating and coasting along, <coughs> being in the way. However, if you're in an organization with a certain structure, and now we can say, let's say you're hired as a consultant to go into this very big architecture and fix it. The guy says, I want you to make it reactive. And I do. You have a mainframe, and you have an Oracle database, and you have a bunch of VT20 terminals there, and I want this to become reactive. He's like, yeah, go for it. Fix my mainframe. OK. So you can't just do that, of course. You can't just go and change existing systems. They, they, they are not just difficult to change. They are designed to not be changeable. I mean, half the, the work of building an organization is to survive attempts to change it afterwards. Right. It's like this, this theory of politics is, a, is organizing to win some conflict and then organizing to stop other people from beating it, taking you out. And organizations defend themselves very aggressively against change. And if you go to an organization and say, we're going to change you, they will fire you. They will kill you, they will fire you, they will murder you, and they will, they will put salt on your grave. They, it's not a nice thing to do. It doesn't matter if the, if the VP supports you. He will get kicked out as well. Okay. So the way you change a big architecture, the way you change an organization, is you start again with a small one, obviously. You start with a kernel core. If it's boxes, it's one, you know, one box, one prototype, one proof of concept, one product somewhere. If it's people, it's one team. 
outside, separate. Mm -hmm. It's how IBM made the PC. Yeah. Some guys in, off, 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 the, off the campus. And a few people can learn a new process, can work through the issues, they can internalize it, and they can start building success. And even then, it's very risky. If they get discovered, they'll, they'll still get kicked, you know, kicked out. But if they can do it stealth and get to the point of actually delivering some value to someone of sufficient importance, they may get sponsorship and they may be able to survive and grow that. And certainly once you have a small team that's internalized a successful strategy for distributed development and building that kind of software, then you can grow, then you can scale. Now scalability in software, scalability in organizations comes from expanding on an internalized success. By that I mean you have to have a successful core to build on. You can't just add boxes to a failure, you get more failure. There's Fred Brooks' famous theory about adding people to a slow project makes it even slower. The problem is not lack of person, it's lack of, it's the problem is bad process. The scaling a bad process makes it worse. So once you have a good process, and once it's working, and once the core team has internalized the process and can teach other people with confidence and can tell them why and answer all the questions and say, yes, it works because, because, look, then you can grow. Until that point, you can't grow. All you can do is, is, is spend money and, and be in trouble. So probably if you're going to build large distributed systems and you have the chance, the best possibility is a startup, a separate company with its own money, its own authority, where you can start, internalize the, the principles, and then grow slowly over time. And as you get market success, you can then grow pretty fast. Once you've got your cloud architecture working, you can add more workers very cheaply. The cost of adding people should be very low. And scalability is essentially about that. It's about having successful patterns and then reducing the cost of adding. The marginal incremental cost should be as close as possible to zero. So for instance, when we have a community of contributors, how do we scale? We don't scale by marketing and by propaganda. We scale by reducing the cost of participation. To join should be really, really, really cheap. There should be as few things to sign or agree, there should be, in fact, we only have that one thing, read that contract, please read the rules, it's a game we're playing, read the rules, then you can join. And even those rules are pretty obvious unless you have a strange existing mindset. Uh, to reprogram you, that's more work. But for ordinary, naive developers, it's what they would expect, it's what they would dream of, so it fits in with their expectations, it's a very easy sell. Low formality, then we can scale very quickly. We also scale by letting people build their own projects. It's the same with distributed systems. If, you're, if there's a protocol you can implement, anyone here implements the web browser or web server, HTTP server? It's fun, isn't it? You take the spec, you read it, you say, hey, okay, this is kind of complex, but it's a 20-line it's a program, the first version, and you start making code, implements a protocol. That should be allowed in any organization, in any community. Take the specs, implement them. No one should own the right to implement a certain domain. Somebody may own that spec, in a certain sense. Somebody may have written it and be responsible for it. And somebody may be responsible for certain parts of the code. People can create their own projects, they can plug into a known framework, they can scale. And the best judgment of where to invest time is locally. People know the problem, they know the market, they will invest where they know best. And again, that's why centralized decision making is really a tragic thing because you cannot actually know what's happening. And finally, shared state and centralized state. It's very much the same as authority. It's this notion that we could know all the problems in one single space, when in fact the problems are decentralized as much as the solutions. The problems are spread out in a vast landscape. And the only way to actually discover them and answer them <coughs> marginally, accurately, and cheaply is to be there on that space decentralized and have that local point of view and be able to solve them there. So that's. Conway's law, the organization will produce the software, given the right rules, given the right structure. If it's a bad organization, it will produce bad software. If it's a distributed, decentralized, scalable, event-driven, lazy, opportunistic organization, the kind I love, it will produce that kind of software. That's the thesis. We'll see next year how far this goes, how well it works. Thanks to Martin for raising that idea. And we have to have some questions and some discussion now. How long do we have? About 10 minutes? Okay, so.
as the gentleman just said, we're talking the last point. Um, I have a theory that if you let developers decide on what they want to work on, they will often work on interesting problems and interesting technology rather than what's necessarily right. in the interest of the overall organisation. Absolutely. Uh, this is a this is a I would say it's a talent of creative people. So developers basically here's the, the problem is developers if you let them work freely on anything they want to work on, they will they will not actually work on business critical issues at all. They'll just go off and, and you know have fun and stuff and say, Well this is very important, I'm writing a new compiler. Okay. Why? Well because I want to optimize the database index and you know I'm make I'm making a new compiler, it's fun. It's like, no. Developers like to make stuff. Artists like to make stuff. I, I like to write my books. Thirty nine ninety nine. <laughs> if it's not answering a real need, that's a that's a waste of time. It may be fun, but I shouldn't be earning a salary for that. So, management's management job management job is to ensure that every line of code, every line of code, is connected tangibly and measurably to a business need. In other words, if you're a developer, if, if you work for me and you're committing patches to my repository and I can't see for every single commit the problem that this is solving, spelled out, explicitly spelled out, and you're telling me why this is the simplest plausible solution to that problem, I won't pay you for that patch. I'll be like, that's fine, you can, you can, you can do this, but I will even let you fork and do it in your own space. Don't do it in my repository. My code base will not have technical debt. If you're giving me that, I'm going to teach you as a problem now. I may fire you for doing that. And certainly try ask you to lead the community if it's, if it's a recurrent thing. So engineers shouldn't be free. It's like having a server just running in a corner. What's the server doing? Oh, it's serving. It doesn't, no, no. It's got to be dealing with events from the outside world. It's got to have a supply chain of problems all the way from the customer, all the way through to the developer, and all the way back. And that supply chain has to be built and connected and react responsive and resilient and fast. And then problems come in, get broken down. And what we humans are very good at is divide and conquer. We're very good at taking large problems and breaking them down and then fanning them out and specializing in particular areas and solving them. We're very good at that. And you'll find that engineers are actually much happier when they're solving real problems than when they're just inventing stuff to do. They're actually much happier having a constructive feedback for their work than to be working for six months on something that they hope they hope will be useful, because they're often wrong with that. In fact, they're mostly wrong with that. Most visionary work is just garbage, utter trash. Okay. Um, so how do you, in a strictly context, um, prioritize issues? Then? How do you prioritize? This is the number one problem with any workload management, any, is prioritization. How do you prioritize the events coming in a queue? Ah, first, you have a queue. You don't just throw events at a system and say, here's 2,000 events. No, you have a queue, and they come in order. That's the first and the most obvious and the most effective organization is first come, first serve, and you have a queue with one event at a time. If your code is trying to process 10 events at a time, that won't work. It's going to get very confused and very bizarre. So here's my, my message processing task. I have a queue, and I will send it events, and it will process them one by one. That's a very simple, very effective 80% case, and it applies to developers much anything else. So the, the goal with, uh, if you're responsible for project management, is to take all of your issues and then say to your, your one developer, let's say, this is the issue I want you to work on next, this one, one. He does that, you say, perfect, here's the issue I want you to work on next. And as he gets into that, you say, okay, here's your queue of issues. Let me give you a queue of two or three issues you can choose. And as they get better, you can say, okay, and as, as a team, you can build up your queue of issues and have a few that are high priority. All the rest are just trash again. So keep the visibility very, very short term. There's no emergency, critical, high priority, medium priority, low priority, nice to have. That's trash. There's only do it now or don't do it now. That's all that's worth doing. The second thing is you can have multiple queues. You can actually have a high priority queue and a low priority queue if you really want that. Obviously, a production issue will be fixed now, whereas a issue for you know the next month's travel season will be fixed in maybe two weeks' time. Obviously, you can have multiple queues, which we do. 
networks as well. That's a little bit more advanced. So in terms of prioritization, you log all of your issues, you track them as, as problem statements, not as solutions, but as problems. So every issue we log is in a, in a, in a proper project is problem, name of problem, description of problem, possible solution. The problem is what you focus. And the issue tracker has everything logged explicitly. There's no email communication about issues. There's no chats about issues, except, in fact, there shouldn't be. Everything should be on, on paper, so you can come back and look at it afterwards and see what was discussed and see why the argumentation was like that. As a stranger, you can come in and see and get the whole state. There's no out-of-band discussion. And then someone will just mark those issues as critical. Somebody who understands the business, someone who represents the clients, will say, that's the critical <coughs> issue next. I want those two by tomorrow. I need those two to deliver something. And they're, 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 they're betting. I mean, they're working for the business. They have that need. They can, they can express it to developers. That seems to work. Right? And it maps to a distributed architecture where workers get requests one by one from something that knows the prioritization that can talk to clients, a typical architecture. Does that help? Martin. You mentioned management. I, I see management very much as an empty pattern. And I think what many organizations actually lack is leadership. Right. So um, management represents an anti pattern. Yes. So I, right. I, would, I would argue that leadership is responsible for setting direction, helping with the prioritization, and also providing resource, but not managing individuals, which is a very different thing. Is this a question or a statement? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> There's. There's a lot of work being done on uh, business structures, management structures, and so on. Uh, a very good reference is Chris Argiris with his Model 1, Model 2. Have a look at that if you can. And there's a very interesting discussion there about how we learn as a group, the difference between a hierarchy and a, a collaboration. In a hierarchy, you can have very smart people who learn something from a reference source, from a book, or from university, whatever it is, and then they apply that. They apply that in a straight line, very aggressively, very dominantly. You know, I have read the book. I am now an expert. I will now apply this wisdom. And I will bully my way through to success, because you are all wrong and I am right. And I have the authority. It's my money, or I know the boss, or I have married to his daughter, whatever it is. So that's kind of the model one. And it can be moderately successful. It can produce results, because you can actually, you can actually be right sometimes. Very different model two is where we learn as we, as we go through. Our knowledge that we come with is a starting point, but as we're working, we're learning. And the leadership in that is simply to tell the team, this is how we're going to work. We are going to learn like this. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I might tell you what the problems are. I might let you choose which ones you work on. And I might judge you on that afterwards. I might, I might actually fire you if all you work on are rubbish problems. Seriously. If you're not that good, we are a team, you know, we're like a football team, and if you're not good enough, I will get you off the team. As a team, we will survive, and I will find you money, I will find you computers, I will find you internet and coffee, or tea, I will find you desks to sit on, but I won't tell you how to write your code, I will give you rules if you need them, and I'll fix all of your problems. And I will also program, that's a great leader, that's what you want. You don't want someone saying, this is how we will, this is your, your UX and specification document, here's a 10,000 page analysis, go off and make it. If you get that, just change companies. Gentlemen at the back. Um, bit of a comment, actually, about that. Bit of a comment about that, actually. Um, Henry Ford has a lot to answer for, because we, when people say manager, nowadays we think guy standing at the head of the assembly line telling everybody to turn the branch right. over. Manager can mean anything. Yes. You could be a, your architect's manager. You yes. are a manager. I'm architect. a manager of my community, for example. That is my job. I do manage the community. I, well, Henry Ford was taking completely unskilled labor and turning them into you know, robots in a certain sense, which at the time was successful. If you look at how Toyota built cars today, it's very different. In Toyota, everybody has responsibility. When there's a problem, they stop the supply chain. They stop the whole thing. It's an assertion. They say, stop. We are going to fix the problem. We're going to learn and then carry on. So the cars all come out perfect. It's a very different approach. But it requires a much more educated workforce in a certain sense. There's a lot more culture of how to work together, which has accumulated over the years. So I can't blame Henry Ford for doing it. That was, that was at the time, was what we had. 
Today we know a lot better. Um, the, ma the managers are essential in the sense that it's, it's insane to ask developers to talk to clients. It's insane to ask developers to look for money or think about problems like infrastructure. I mean, physical infrastructure. Their job is to focus on solutions. And they should be aware of things like you know, the cost of code and technical stuff. That's their job. So they need somebody to protect them from the outside world and feed them in different ways. That's what the manager should be doing. Solving problems, looking for problems. So when I was working in, in, in some teams, I thought of myself as, you know, in ice hockey, you have these guys that score the goals. You have these really big, nasty guys with no teeth that protect them from other bullies, right? That was my job. And I was just fighting off the insane vice presidents who wanted to destroy the project. That's all I did. <laughs> Look for problems and kick off <coughs> so that the good guys could score goals. That's what management should do, I think, is protect their team from, from interference also. But we're way beyond assembly line in software. Somewhere, I feel that the acceptance of failure is lacking in, in any organization that grows a little bit bigger. Yes. I was assigned a problem nobody wants to look at. Yes. I go find four problems nobody had found for a number of uh, years. Then I'm told afterwards, you did it in an unorthodox way, that's yes. good. You need to do more of that if you want to be promoted, but you are not allowed to fail. Who here does code reviews in their job? Mm -hmm. Or is subject to it, or does them, or has them? Okay. Uh, code reviews, are they synchronous or asynchronous? Synchronous. synchronous, right? So they're blocking. Okay, so they're basically a problem. They're a bad thing, not a good thing. Now you're like, Peter, if they're a bad thing, that means that people just do any code. I'm like, well, obviously learning is a good thing. And code reviews as a learning tool are very good. Code reviews as a way to stop somebody from committing code are a very big mistake. If you can't commit bad code, you can't make mistakes. You know the story of the, um, if you go to a doctor's office and you sit down, it's an experiment on people. You go to this office and you sit in the waiting room and smoke comes in the door. Then the normal reaction which 100% of people will have is, oh, smoke, smoke means fire, fire means death, I'm leaving. Very standard. However, if in that same room there's two other people sitting there and the same smoke comes under the door, then what they all think is, Ah, smoke. Smoke means fire, fire means death, but I could be wrong, so I'm going to stay. And two-thirds of people will just stay in the room and not move. And they look at them, they look around at strangers, people they never see again or never met before, they look at them and say, he's not worried or she's not worried, I'll stay, I'm not going to look like an idiot. He would rather die than be proven wrong. That's how important status is. And code reviews are a way to blackmail people into submission by threatening them with status. Say, we will make you look like a fool is really, really bad. So, of course you can review code and we do that, but it should be an asynchronous thing that happens without stopping the commit process, without stopping the actual learning process. So, the best way to see code uh, as, a, as a problem is to see it actually running and failing. See someone else patching it and improving it. That can't happen until it's been committed. So I would much rather take the code, merge it, improve it, explain why I improved it, than argue with somebody about improving it up front. <coughs> and if they don't learn by observation, they're not going to learn anyway. I'm teaching them a pattern for learning. If they don't take the pattern, then they're probably not going to help. We have one more question. Then we have lunch. Is anyone working like this today in their organization or community? In this kind of distributed, event-driven, lazy, reactive model. One, two, Mahesh. Yes. Okay. Uh, my prediction is that those of you who aren't will be out of a job within a certain future. Either your organization will die, your company will go bankrupt. In a not very distant future, I'm talking about a few years. So if you're interested in having a long-term future in this business, and I've said this about Zero MQ many times, this is the kind of thing you have to know to have a job in the future. Decentralized distributed programming. Same for your organizations. Look for organizations, if you can't find them, make them. That give you this freedom, because with it you can be very powerful without it. You will just be a Henry Ford robot, and you will eventually just lose your job. Thank you all very much.